There are a handful of franchises that come to mind when I think of games that have frequent releases. Some obvious examples are the EA Sports games, as well as the Call of Duty titles. But even outside of that, I think back to the Mario Party titles being pretty close to yearly releases when I was younger. The cool thing about this is that those frequent releases make the franchise relatable across generations. So many people have tons of memories playing FIFA, but there's a good chance those nostalgic memories aren't all from the same two or three FIFA games. Many of these franchises have drastically improved over time, but at the same time, people who upgrade yearly might not even realize how much better each new iteration is unless they return to a game from 4 or 5 years prior. For every advantage these releases create, a disadvantage can be spotted. While it's great that we had 4 Mario Party GameCube games to call our own, if you speak to an average fan of the Mario Party franchise, they probably only played one or two of them. It creates somewhat of a blockade in the community's memories for the series. Whereas something like Smash Bros. or Mario Kart only got a single game per console, creating a bonding community for that specific title for each generation, rather than an endless debate on which game is better. However, the biggest risk that can come out of these excessive releases is it can easily lead to many of these titles becoming forgettable. Mega Man had six titles on the NES, and in that same amount of time they were releasing the handheld games as well. The latter three NES games came out after the launch of the SNES, Many people assume Mega Man's 4 low sales numbers were due to the SNES already being out, but back then most people weren't early adopters, and the SNES didn't really take off until a few years later anyway. In my opinion, there were more significant factors that affected its sales. First, if you consider the amount of games people used to buy back in the late 80s and early 90s, if you already owned Mega Man 2 or 3 or both of them, you'd likely want to buy something else because there was a larger library of popular Nintendo games people wanted to get their hands on, and they might not want to pick Mega Man 4 as their Christmas gift when they might not get another game until their birthday. Second, if anyone decided to give any of the first three Mega Man games a shot and learned they didn't like the game, it might have turned them away from the series. So they wouldn't take that same gamble on the fourth game that they did on the first three. And finally, Nintendo was really pushing out Mega Man 2 and 3 to the masses with Nintendo Power. More so Mega Man 2. And while Mega Man 4 did get some attention, it wasn't the most important thing on the menu at the time of its release. All of this adds up to a drastic drop in sales numbers that might not have anything at all to do with the game. Because as I mentioned earlier, one of the benefits to these frequent releases is it gives a developer a chance to add both major and minor improvements all throughout the game, since they don't need to spend as much time on the base itself. All six Mega Man NES games, for the most part, look and play the exact same way. If they were released today, we'd consider them DLC or level packs. And as far as my experience goes, I think they've gotten better with every single title, and Mega Man 4 is no exception to the rule. It is mind-boggling to me that people can look back at Mega Man 2 and say it's one of the best ones, when it's not even better than Mega Man 3. And likewise, 4 improved on the flaws 3 had so much that I can't imagine why anyone wouldn't view 4 as the better title than the previous one. I genuinely wonder how someone who was a fan of the second game can look back and not think that 4 is better because 4 takes everything that was good about Mega Man 2, and 3 for that matter, and improves the game all around. Okay, actually, I, I don't wonder it. I think the reason is obviously nostalgia. Just like it's the reason that everyone swears to death that the game they played as a kid is better than the one you played as a kid. I'm almost willing to go out on a limb and say that Mega Man 4 is the first truly complete experience. And by that I mean, it's the first one of the games that didn't have an obnoxious retro game bottleneck. Which, if you haven't watched my Sonic 06 video, is an infamous and unfair difficulty spike that was popular in older games. Mega Man 1 had the Magnet Beam requirement that might lead to a ton of backtracking and searching. Mega Man 2 had the Boo Beam fight which might require you to either do a bunch of farming or completely restarting the endgame a bunch of times while figuring out how to get through it. And Mega Man 3 had the Dock Robot stages, which had some of the hardest Robot Master fights in stages that weren't very generous with their checkpoints. The only thing I can think of that comes remotely close to this kind of blockade in Mega Man 4 is the final boss fight which would require a difficult amount of experimentation to figure out you need to use the Pharaoh shot, and how to time it. But that's the final boss fight, which you'd expect to be a climactic challenge, rather than a random moment somewhere in the game where you're just wondering what the heck is all of the BS I'm dealing with all of a sudden. But simply not having an unfair difficulty spike is not all the game has to offer. Along with the slide that was introduced in Mega Man 3, and improved Mega Man's moveset, this game introduces the Mega Buster, which takes Mega Man's regular pea shooter or arm cannon and turns it into a chargeable default weapon you have on hand at all times. Quite literally. While I do consider this an improvement on Mega Man's moveset, I've seen many debates circling around its inclusion. 
Detractors will generally argue that the Mega Buster's power causes the remaining weapons in the game to be negligible. But I'm inclined to say I disagree. The only unfair benefit I found for the Mega Buster is it saves a bit of time. Enemies that would normally take multiple hits and require you to wait for openings can be defeated much quicker with a single good shot, which removes a lot of the patience that was once required to get through an area. Aside from that though, the Mega Buster's power is balanced by the requirement to charge it up. When you're just mashing away at the pea shooter, there's no real penalty for missing a shot. You can just keep shooting away in every direction as you run. But as you charge your shot, you're not only vulnerable to attacks because you can't use the pea shooter to defend yourself, but you're also pressured into making sure you aim the charge shot well enough so you can't simply just fire multiple charge shots in a row as you battle. For that reason, if you're facing off against a Robot Master and you only have the Mega Buster available, while yes, landing your charge shots will help you defeat the enemy faster, if you don't have or don't know the weakness, you're also a lot more likely to lose a bunch of health in the process, and also drastically punished if you miss your shot. But even aside from that, during the previous videos I didn't really need to delve that deep into the weapons you get during the game. All of the stages were always beatable with a pea shooter, and the Robot Master weapons were only used for specific boss battles 80% of the time. There's usually one or two weapons in each of the previous games that I would consider my go-to, otherwise I'd stick with the pea shooter. In the case of Mega Man 4, I thought with the inclusion of the Mega Buster that the one or two weapon benchmark would have been completely subsided, but I was surprised at how useful most of the weapons were in this game. And furthermore, how unique they were in relation to the simplicity of the arm cannon. And again, I stress this because many people claim the charge shot removes any need for any other weapons to be utilized, which I completely don't agree with. First, the Skull Barrier isn't even a projectile and provides a shield around you similar to the Leaf Shield. But it's been improved upon in that you can actually move around with it equipped. It's useful in areas of the game when you might be suddenly attacked from just above or just below you. Next, you have the Flash Stopper, which is an improvement on the Time Stopper since not only does it not automatically stop everything to a halt until it's out of energy, but you can actually use a projectile while it's applied. Also, there aren't any stages wasted around its gimmick, like there was in Mega Man 2. The Flash Stopper is very useful in this game if you're in a bind and it can help you ease through some of the more difficult challenges if needed. So right off the bat, the first two weapons in this game are not only not weapons that the Mega Buster would deem pointless, but they're also two weapons that improved upon poorly utilized weapons in Mega Man 2. Next you have the Rain Flush, which fills the entire area you're in with acid rain that harms enemies. It's good in areas with multiple baddies on the screen, but it's also useful if you're in a mini boss fight and want to weaken the mini boss without requiring too much skill. The Dive Missile is a projectile, but it has homing powers which makes it very useful and pretty unique. The Pharaoh Shot has the ability to aim at an upwards and downwards angle, which I found very useful during my playthrough. The Ring Boomerang is a rapid fire attack and it can hit twice since it returns back to you. It's also useful at cleaning out garbage in Dustman stage. That leaves us with Drill Bomb and Dust Crusher, the only two weapons that I'd argue the Mega Buster could fully replace. Except no, there's a big difference. First, after the Drill Bomb hits it explodes which allows a wider range of damage. And after the Dust Crusher hits, it sends 4 projectiles on 45 degree angles away from the point of impact which could also lead to more damage. But more importantly, both of these attacks, and all other attacks, can be spammed. The Mega Buster can't be spammed. You have to charge it. I can fire multiple Dust Crushers or Drill Bombs without needing to recharge. Something I can't do with a Mega Buster. So they have their uses. And when they run out of ammo, at that point I can rely on the Mega Buster. Saying the Mega Buster replaces all of the Robot Master weapons you can collect in this game is as weak as an argument as saying the Pea Shooter is all you need in the Mega Man games prior to this one because you can get through most of the game with just a Pea Shooter. I think the reason these Mega Man games are so enjoyable on their second playthroughs is not only because you learn the weakness chain, but also because you have the ability to apply what you've learned with the various weapons on your first playthrough as you run through the game a second time. And that's applicable whether there's a charge shot available or not. Speaking of which, Similarly to Mega Man 3, I didn't feel Mega Man 4 needed a second playthrough. I got through it in about two and a half hours comfortably the first time, and I didn't think there was too much to improve upon on my second playthrough. However, the footage I got was corrupted, so I had to replay the game anyway, and obviously this time I ran through it in weakness order, which was less of a challenge on the boss fights, resulting in a two hour long runtime, and still quite a bit of a challenge. Like a fair challenge. A good challenge. So my experience with this game that we're going to jump through is actually my second time, which I think isn't nearly as interesting as when it's the first run, but I'll apply lessons and talking points from my first run in the discussion where applicable. The next thing to mention before I get into the actual experience of the game are the items, mainly the Rush Powers, making a return. Rush Marine and Rush Coil are back, and similar to the application Mega Man 3. 
Rush Jet was slightly nerfed in that you can't really freely fly around anymore, and it's more similar to the item in Mega Man 2 that just had the jet flying forward. But you can make slight vertical adjustments as you blast through. While this is a nerf, I think it's a good nerf akin to how they nerfed the Metal Saw in Mega Man 2 when they introduced a similar attack in Mega Man 3 with a Shadow Blade, but made it more balanced of a weapon so that it doesn't become OP. The Rush Jet is still very useful, but it's less likely to break the game and simply helps challenges in an area. In addition to the Rush abilities, we have two items. The Balloon Adapter, which is similar to an item from Mega Man 2 that creates a rising platform, and the Wire Adapter, which allows you to reach above you and grip onto a ceiling and pull yourself up. To give you an idea of how useful these adapters are, during my first playthrough, I didn't use them. And I can count on maybe only two E-Tanks in the game that I couldn't grab because I didn't have the adapters. Pretty much every other moment that they'd be useful for, the Rush Coil or Jet would suffice. They weren't really a necessary addition. But their inclusion is kinda neat, because outside of the Magnet Beam in the first game, and I guess the E-Tanks or the other regenerators throughout the stages, this is the first time that there are actual hidden collectibles in the game that motivate you to do some searching. Which, if memory serves me correct, is something that becomes a bit more common starting in the next few games in the series. But yeah, I don't really think they're necessary, and you can easily finish the entire game without them, because, well, that's literally what happened to me the first time. And finally, before we get through the playthrough, I need to praise the production value of this game. The visuals are an improvement on the last game. But like I mentioned earlier, with frequent releases, you might not notice a drastic jump from Mega Man 3 to 4. But if you go back to Mega Man 2 or 1, you can tell they've started putting a lot more detail into the colors and backgrounds. But even if paired up against Mega Man 3, I think this game is a bit cleaner and the enemies and set pieces all around look better. You also get actual story beats and an intro cutscene that goes into detail about the creation of Mega Man. But I've gone through so much detail and lore about the story in this series in my previous videos that it wouldn't be worth regurgitating it all here yet again. This game has the same premise as the previous three games, except this time there's a Russian doctor named Cossack that is controlling the Robot Masters and a plot twist at the end that shows Wily was blackmailing him to do so because he kidnapped Cossack's daughter. So yeah, it's basically the same setup with the minor detail differences. But I think the most important thing I have to praise about this game is the music. Hands down, the best soundtrack out of all the games i played thus far. In the previous three games, I felt there would always be two or three tracks that would really stick out to me and make me turn my headphones up and bob along as I get through the stage. Usually, it'd be somewhere in the endgame. But I swear, in Mega Man 4, it must have happened five or six times. I felt like almost every other stage I'd enter right away and it was just like, ah yeah, here we go. With that perfect hint of epicness. But without further ado, I'm ready to jump through my actual experience with you, and give you my analysis. When you boot the game up, you're treated to some context involving Mega Man's backstory. It's basically the story for the first Mega Man game. Dr. Light and Wily made a bunch of robots to protect the world. Wily went rogue and programmed them to become evil. Mega Man volunteered to be turned into a robot hero. That's the gist of it. But I do like this clip of Mega Man with the wind blowing his hair. I'm not used to seeing sights like this on the NES games. But I guess being released so late in the NES life would allow them to take full advantage of all that's been learned of the hardware. Anyway, seeing as how this was my second playthrough, I kinda knew the optimal boss order and weakness chain. Coincidentally, even on my first playthrough, I started with Dive Man, but I remember I couldn't even make it to the Robot Master without getting a game over, so I tried a different stage first. Regardless, here we go, Dive Man stage. A great stage to start with because I think it puts in one of the game's strongest stages up front. The music right off the bat is one of the best tracks. The low gravity gimmick in the water is fun to mess around with, and the visuals are pretty entertaining. I'm not fully sure why I struggled so much with this on my first playthrough. It's pretty easy to run through if you're careful. The Moby miniboss can be defeated with a few charged up shots. Also, you get to meet Eddie pretty early on. He's this little friend that helps you out by giving you a regenerator or an E-Tank. You'll eventually make it to this stage's version of the typical jumping boss, but being able to charge your shot makes the challenge a bit more doable. The only downside is if you backtrack even a bit while defeating him. As soon as you move forward, there'll be another one waiting for you. After you drop back down, you're in the water again, and this time you have to be a bit careful to dodge some undefeatable robot jellyfish before taking on another Moby miniboss again. If you drop down into this pit, and you'll probably only drop down if you know what's down there already, you collect the wire adapter, which could be helpful as the game goes on. The stage sets you back a bit, so you'll have to retread some of the ground and take down Moby again, before making it to an area that involves a bunch of floating mines that you have to maneuver around. By this point, I had low health, so I got beat by Dive Man pretty quickly. But on my life with a full health, I was able to beat him by dodging his dive bombs and his advances towards me and hitting him with charge shots. Next, Drillman. 
This stage has a few annoying flying robot heads that always seem to raise their elevation just enough to cause you to miss your first shot towards them. Once you get used to their pattern, it becomes easier to avoid their dodge, but it's still annoying. When you make it past the opening area, you take on a jumping robot, and then as you continue to climb, you have to take on more helicopter dudes before dropping down and avoiding a bat while picking up some health and a 1-up if you can platform carefully. Continue on against more helicopter heads, and eventually face off against turrets, and you'll make it to the first use of the wire adapter, before getting charged at by these robotic unicycles. This final area has rocks that drop down and can harm you, but their debris after they land can also harm you. The trick, if you don't have the skull shield yet to protect you, is to shoot the rock just before it lands in front of you, stopping it from splashing the debris towards you. You also need to hit some of the switches to activate the invisible floors while avoiding some flying baddies overhead, before making it to Drillman. Drillman will use Dig and you'll have to wait for him to pop up and try to hit him with your dive missiles. If you have low health, you might have to wait for your second life to give it a shot. You do have to fight pretty defensively against him, because his attacks are strong so you need to focus more on avoiding his hits more than actually hitting him since the dive missile does home in on him a bit. After you defeat him, you'll have the Drill Bomb and can continue on to Toadman's stage. The gimmick here is the wind blowing back at you indicated by the pattern of the rain. When you make your jumps up the platforms, you have to really leap from the edge otherwise you won't be able to make it to the next platform because of the force pushing you back. Of course, during all of this, there are random sewer robots you have to avoid. When you make it down to the next area, there's flowing water on your path that you have to navigate around while it's pushing you in the direction of its flow, until you eventually make it to the stale mini-boss. You can only weaken it by attacking it while its eyes are open. I found the dive bomb pretty useful against it since it homes in on its eyes. You'll continue through the sewer and make it to another snail, but this time the water flowing will affect the ground you're standing on, which will make it a bit more challenging. In the next area, you can platform over some water while piranhas jump out at you. I once again found the dive bomb very useful here. Also, you have to carefully not miss a jump because you'll land on spikes. When you make it to Toadman, you can beat him pretty easily because this is a famous boss. The trick is to not let him use his attacks and just keep letting him jump over you while you unload your P-Shots at him. You could probably start with Toadman's boss for that reason, since you probably won't even use his weakness against him anyway. But I find this stage easier with the dive bomb rather than just with the Mega Buster. Toadman will give you the Acid Rain so you can go against Brightman. The gimmick of this stage is that there are two main enemies. Defeating them will either turn the lights on or off depending on which one it is you defeat. You'll make it to an area with grasshoppers over spikes, so you have to ride while shooting down some totem poles in your way. As you continue on, you'll beat some big robots and face a bunch of spinners that drop from the ceiling and try to hurt you. You'll make it to an area with these swinging objects if you're curious, but it's not required to go through. When you're back on the main path, you get to more grasshoppers over spikes against totem poles. Before climbing back up and making it to more of these swinging platforms, you have to time your jumps off of the edge of to advance while avoiding some more light bulb robots. When you get to Brightman, you'll have to keep spamming the Acid Rain attack, but Brightman does have the power to freeze you in place too while shooting you, so you have to be quick and careful about where you're standing if you're starting to run low on health. After that, you can get to Pharaohman stage, which takes place in a desert against a night backdrop. A great soundtrack too. You'll have to avoid some of the scorpions while hopping through sinking sand, there's also a pit at the end of the first area you can fly over with Rush Jet and bounce your way across more sand to get to the Balloon Adapter. After that, you enter the Pyramid, and you have to ride some enemies that hover over the spikes while being attacked by swarms of bats. It offers a good challenge, and you'll likely take some hits. In the next area, the bats are replaced with mummies that launch their heads at you. Pharaoh Man's weakness is the Flash Stopper, so this boss fight becomes a literal joke if you're doing it in the right order. I've heard Pharaoh Man's a difficult boss otherwise, but I've never tried to fight him without Brightman's Flash Stopper, so it's always a joke as far as my experience goes. Next, you'll take on Ringman. Again, the music is just... Mwah. You'll likely climb up these disappearing platforms on the space theme. You'll face off against a giant hippo mini-boss, and then make it to more disappearing platform challenges, but in this case it's horizontal platforming. The next mini-boss is this really weird ring stack that I really struggled against on my first playthrough, but on this playthrough I tried using the rain attack, and it made such quick work of it that I was so relieved. When you beat him, you'll get to another fight against a hippo that the dive bomb works perfectly flawlessly against. If you continue on, you'll make it to another eddy if you get curious when you see the ladder. As you advance, you get through more disappearing platforms, use a fully charged pharaoh shot to defeat a ring boss, and get to ring man and realize you wasted too much of your pharaoh shot attack because he's not that easy. But the cool thing about the pharaoh shot attack is that if it's fully charged and an enemy runs into it, they lose some health without you losing ammo. I had to finish ring man off with a drill bomb, but it was pretty close at the end because his ring attack is way stronger than you expect. After you defeat Ringman, you can move on to Dustman stage, a literal garbage dump. 
You have to avoid a bunch of these charging shields, but perhaps the most annoying enemy are these guys that drop from the top because if you jump into them, they'll drop you directly into the pit even though it seems like they shouldn't. So every pit means you have to proceed with caution and defeating them all before dropping down and getting to an area of these forming platforms while avoiding the flying and dodging robots. If you get through that, Eddie will come by to say hi and you'll make it to a compactor area. The trick is that you need to shoot the trash to advance while avoiding getting crushed. The ring shot is very useful here because it comes back when you shoot it so it can clear out two rows of trash. When you get past that, you'll climb up and face a few more enemies along your path before making it to Dustman. When Dustman attacks, you'll want to jump right before his attack makes it to you so that his follow-up debris can miss you. You'll also want to spam the ring attack on him whenever he's not in his defensive state, and you should be able to beat him pretty quickly if you do so. Finally, Skullman. And dude, this music, I love it. There's a bone theme and some generic enemies as well as skeletons that only a fully charged Mega Buster can defeat, otherwise they come back to life like a dry bones. There's a special area that you can collect E-Tanks and refill health if you choose, but you have to maneuver around charging shields. In the next area, you'll face off against some turrets and some caterpillar looking robots that'll drop from the ceiling without warning you as you move towards them. As long as you keep a charged Mega Buster and advance through the stage carefully, you should be able to get through most of it without breaking a sweat. If you equip the Dust Crusher, you should be able to defeat Skullman with just a few shots when his defenses are down. After the 8 Robot Masters are defeated, we make it to Dr. Cossack's castle. His first stage is an outdoor winter theme and the first group of enemies you face are Slinkies, which is just so 90s. In the next area, you can use a Toad Shot to defeat the enemies above. And in the following area, you can charge up your Mega Buster and carefully maneuver past the enemies shooting up from the pits while shooting some skeletons. You'll also be given a few opportunities to restock ammo as needed before making it to an area where either the adapters or rush could be used to get through. With the hardest area involving ladders with some bad guys on there that can knock you off if you're not careful. Make it through here, beat a jumping robot, and you get to this weird butterfly looking enemy that a ring shot should make fairly light work of, if you have a decent amount of health and are careful to avoid its attacks. The next Cossack stage takes place in rooms full of spikes, with a larger area you need to use the rush jet to maneuver around followed by some square platform spikes that you can either jump through or avoid altogether. In the next area after that, there will be multiple spots where a wire shot or a rush can be used to get a collectible, as well as a room that offers you a chance to collect health, ammo, and E-Tanks, but only if you know that you can use the drill bomb to shoot some barricades out of the way. Finally, a 1-up is available before making it to the next boss. A giant square split into three parts that you have to jump inside and ride the little platforms and unload on its weak point as much as you can before it disconnects. It's an interesting boss fight, and in my case the first time I had to use an E-Tank on this run because its projectile is pretty strong, even though attacking it is pretty easy. The next stage is an auto-scroller. What is this? Mario? On a serious note, this actually does feel like Mario 3's ship levels because there are turrets that shoot at you, as well as enemies that hug the platforms you're trying to jump on and avoid them. There are some areas where the challenges can be made easier with an adapter or rush, before you make it to a section with platforms that drop when you land on them, so you have to keep hopping as you platform across and defeat the enemies. Like I said, Mario. In the last area, there's an E-Tank that I'm pretty sure only the balloon adapter would work to collect. Before making it to a fight against these two spider robots, which are pretty comfortable to defeat and avoid their attacks. Finally, you make it to Dr. Cossack. Well, first, you go through some rooms with simple challenges and ample opportunities to restock your health, E-Tanks, ammo, and lives. This stage is pretty underwhelming, and the fight against Dr. Cossack is no exception. You need to avoid his claw. He rides a giant crane-like ship while trying to grab you, and you're going to want to jump up and shoot his ship while avoiding him. Eventually, his daughter drops in, and you find out why he kidnapped her and forced Cossack to fight Mega Man. And I guess Proto Man is the one that saved Cossack's daughter, because Wily is angry at Proto Man due to all of this. Cossack's whole tower and fights all felt very underwhelming, and it's because they weren't the actual endgame. They were basically a replacement for the Doc Robot stages from Mega Man 3. They give you a chance to use all of the weapons and items you've gained throughout the game to go through minor challenges but also collect many lives and E-Tanks in preparation for Wily stages, which are a lot harder and feel more like the proper endgame, which is how it should be, since in the previous game the Doc stages were more difficult than the Wily stages, and it just felt off. Anyway, in the first Wily stage you climb up through some rooms and defeat Mets all throughout. There are lots of them and you have to actually be strategic as you maneuver around their attacks. Eventually, you get to an underwater section with spikes and more mets you have to face off against, before getting to an invisible block section that I just use Rush and the wire adapter to get through. Finally, you'll make it to a fight against a giant met. By now, I had 8 energy tanks, so I felt pretty comfortable going into these last few stages. I unloaded a ring shot on the met whenever I got a chance and beat him with just one hit point remaining, luckily. 
The next stage has a bunch of sections with spikes you have to carefully maneuver around before getting to some rooms with simple challenges that you might have to use your slide or rush or adapters to get through. There's a lot being thrown at you in this stage, but it's nothing unique. It's just challenging because there are a lot of narrow areas where you can't really move ahead without carefully defeating enemies. After that, you get to this fight against a giant robot with two moving platforms in front of it. Your best bet is a pea shooter because it's easy to miss your charge shot while aiming at its weak point. I think I burned through two E-Tanks against this guy, so I'm glad I had those. The next stage is the boss rush. I don't really have anything to add, it's the same boss fights again and you're given a chance to restock almost all of your ammo by the time you make it to the fights. Even on my first playthrough I was able to get through them with relative ease. But a lot of the alert from my first playthrough was also me experimenting and applying what I learned to defeat the Robot Masters with their weaknesses. Whereas in this case it was literally just the same fight I went through before because I already knew the weakness order. So to be honest it felt more like a waste of time. I think I've mentioned this in previous videos, but I don't recall if these boss rushes change at all going forward, like if they become more challenging or if they always feel regurgitated, but they're always very lame to go through on repeat playthroughs or any playthrough where you look up the weakness chain. The only enjoyment I can find with a boss rush is if it's your first attempt at facing them with their weaknesses, which means it's really only fun the first time, which I'm frequently back and forth on because I think that should be good enough, but it's laughable how much easier they get when you know their weakness, and it really makes facing a boss rush on repeat playthroughs a boring chore. But anyway, after the boss rush, you get to Wily. The first part of Wily's fight is a formality. You just stand in front and do a charge shot in his mouth. The second phase, you have to hit his weak spot while avoiding a ton of blasts he's shooting at you and they're hard to move around. The annoying thing is that his weak point is pretty high up so you either have to charge up your Mega Buster and shoot it, or you have to use a drill bomb and manually set it off by pressing the shoot button again as soon as close to the weak point, otherwise it'll bounce right off. I legit didn't know this during my first playthrough. So for that one, it was just the charge shots. Finally, the final fight requires the Pharaoh shot. I had to use a guide for this one. Basically, Wily quickly flashes and you have to shoot him as fast as you can. Also, because I was low on Pharaoh shot ammo, I would run into Wily and let my charged up Pharaoh shot damage him before I fired the projectile at him on the next hit. Also, I had to use almost all of my E-Tanks I've been collecting all game by the time I defeated him. His factory blows up, he seemingly flies off into the distance, Mega Man rides home on top of a train as the credits play, another job well done, another game defeated, another video completed, like I said at the start, this is perhaps the most complete experience thus far. And I think the variety and uniqueness of the stages and their challenges plays a large role in that along with everything else I discussed throughout this video. Keep in mind that while I run through these playthroughs and reiterate my experiences, I probably sound like it's all a breeze. But these games are hard. Like they're all very hard. I think the average person is better off looking up weakness orders in these games or heck even using a rewind button on the Legacy Collection. In a lot of cases they're unjustifiably difficult. But the difference is, with Mega Man 4, the difficulty was a difficulty I could stomach. And that's largely because the games before it were so much harder that I've been trained for this. I think if you go straight to Mega Man 4 you'll find a difficult game waiting for you, but it's a game that you could beat without pulling your hair out. There's something I didn't really discuss in the introduction that I think is a testament to the balance of this game. And it's that ever since the Legacy Collection has been released, and a whole new age of Mega Man fans have come into the picture, the thought that Mega Man 2, or even 3, are the best NES Mega Man games has been somewhat shouldered. More people are claiming 4 is better, and I have to imagine it's for very similar reasons as to what I've discussed in this video. I firmly believe Mega Man 2 is only viewed as the best game by people born in the early to mid 80s that spent most of their childhood playing it. Because I can't possibly fathom why you wouldn't automatically view Mega Man 4 as a drastic improvement on the games before it. If I'm wrong, someone's gonna have to explain it to me. Because unlike Sonic and Mario games where those games changed quite a bit, the Mega Man series is way too similar from game to game to not easily spot the improvements as the games move on. Either way, I'm gonna jump straight into Mega Man 5 after this. Once again, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you at the next one. Dean, out.